income uh, on the JSC is the topic, and uh, you know, arguably in the world where we've seen since uh, since the troughs in March around the global markets, we've seen an absolutely mind-boggling rally. Um, you know, money's flowed increasingly into riskier assets, and you know, from DMs is starting to flow into EMs. From um, growth stocks is flowing into into value stocks. Uh, it's from defensives into cyclicals. So in in, in all of this uh, in, incredible noise and an incredible uh, V-shaped market, looking at you know five ten percent yielding income instruments is s simply not that exciting. Um, but but that's that's a very short-term perspective. Uh, and in fact, I'd argue that income is is not about timing the market. These sorts of instruments and these sorts of investments are not about timing the market. There's not a time to hold them and a time to sell them. In fact, um, according to macro cycles, but but in, according to personal investments. So what as what I mean by this is when a person is young, they should be building their capital. So uh, yeah, capital growth is probably more relevant than uh, generating yield of their capital. But as one gets older, that balance should swing much heavier towards uh, generating income off your, off your capital, off your wealth, off your personal balance sheet, such that you can arrive at a point where you don't need to work anymore, which we typically call retirement. So I think income is a perennial topic, uh, irrespective of market cycles. And I'm hoping to unpack some of it, um, hoping to make it simple and um, hoping to uh, keep it entertaining as well. So, sorry, I just need to jump to the next. Oh, there we go. So a couple of talking points for uh, this evening is I wanna unpack two different types of investment returns, uh, then dive into two types of, there's only two types of yield and highlight two major risks. Um, I hope to put together uh, this visualization of yield and risk, which is, you know, all, all these academic topics are nice, but uh, we human beings tend to be graphical. So uh, hopefully this uh, makes a lot more sense when you see it on a graph. And then uh, dive into a snapshot of the available yields on the JSE. At this point, I want to pause and I keep using the word yield, but I've spoken about and this, this topic is income on the JSE. Now, income is a series of cash flows flowing into your bank account. Yield is the interaction between that series of cash flows and how much we paid for it. So yield has an element of pricing involved in it. But for the purposes of this presentation, let's assume yield and income are interchangeable as terms. I then dive into a couple of examples and unpacking different uh, asset classes um, and uh, actually down to actionable items that could, could look interesting. Summary and conclusion, and then we, we take questions. So. There's two types of investment returns. Uh, there's capital growth and there's yield. And the best way to explain them is, is not to go all um, academic, but in fact, think about your bank account. And each one of these uh, types of returns uh, has a cash flow impact on your bank account. If you buy an investment, there's an outflow from your, from your bank account and you now hold that investment. If you get no more capital, if you if there is no more cash flows into your bank account, but uh, until you sell that investment and the money comes back into your bank account, hopefully you've sold it for more than you paid for it. In which case you you've arrived at capital growth. Now capital growth needs you to sell an investment to realize the cash flow. A a perfect example of this would be, for example, a physical commodity. Uh, think of something like gold or platinum. Um, you, you can hold an ounce of gold for as long as you want. It will remain an ounce of gold. You only get the capital back when you sell it. That is the definition of capital growth. Yield is the complete opposite. Yield, you, if you uh, buy an investment as an outflow from your bank account, and then slowly there's a trickle in of uh, a steady trickle in of inflows into your bank account while you're still holding this investment, that's typically a yielding instrument. Now that, that inflow might be uh, through dividends, might be through interest, might be through uh, distributions, like for example, the REITs that is technically classified as rentals uh, in your personal uh, you know, tax statement. All of those uh, inflows 
first of all, they have different tax consequences, um, but you're still holding the investment. So in other words, yielding instruments, yielding investments, you get paid when you hold the investment, not when you sell it. And that's a very important distinction. Now, that's our topic for the evening, but bear in mind that uh, investments can be combinations of these things. A, for example, a good equity investment, a good stock in the market that's paying good dividends and growing its profits can arguably generate capital growth as well as yield. Um, just a final note, obviously, consider all these things, uh, they trigger different taxes, interest versus dividends, and in terms of capital growth, you'd probably be triggering CGT. Um, just touching on that. Now, visualization of, because we're talking about yield, we're talking about income, and yield is how you want prices income, there's really two types of yield, and they depend on the income streams. Very simply, you get income streams that are fixed, meaning the income stream is guaranteed. Then you get variable income streams. These are ones that change for some other reasons. Um, now, across those income streams, there is fundamentally two major risks. On the one hand, you get interest rates and its interaction with inflation. So if we take inflation out of interest rates, you are show how much capital you're being, or how much return you're generating above the devaluation of the currency. And that's what we call real rates uh, or real interest rates. That's a risk that goes up or down. In inflation uh, rises or falls, interest rates fall or rise, et cetera, et cetera. Real rates affect these um, income streams and particularly how we value them. And then the scarier one that hopefully you never encounter in your entire life is counterparty risk. The most common counterparty risk in terms of uh, yielding instruments is credit risk. So if I, I, I'll jump into those. Um, I've, I've kind of unpacked these already. Fixed income investment, the income is fixed. What does happen though is once, and I'll give you an example, a fixed income bond guarantees the holder of that bond a nominal amount of, or in this case, let's say RANDs paid into the investor's bank account. That is a nominal amount of RANDs. So after the bond is issued and it's traded between people and the price changes or the interest rate changes, um, how, you, how one values that income stream of the bond will change. And the mechanism that changes is not the income. It is in fact the market price of the investment that typically moves to adjust for the changing environment and changing risks. A uh, good example, and I've touched on that, is fixed coupon bonds. Floating or variable income investments are typically the opposite, in which case the income is the variable that changes according to the environment or according to certain uh, variables, whereas the market price, if set up paribus, if everything stays the same and the thing income impacting the, the income changes, um, the market price should largely have priced that in. What I mean by that is if you have a floating rate bond um, and interest rates go up or down, the income stream goes up or down. Um, the capital amount of the bond doesn't. Uh, a, a closer to home, we all hopefully have bank accounts. Your cash in the bank, when uh, the reserve bank parks the interest rates, your cash in the bank isn't suddenly worth more or less. It's, it's the same amount of cash you have in the bank. It's just now earning a slightly higher interest rate. Likewise, when they drop interest rates, the cash in the bank stays exactly the same. Cash in the bank or cash in your brokerage account is effectively a floating rate um, yielding instrument. Uh, and another example of a variable income instrument that I've touched on is equity. And I call it variable because dividends are a function of fundamentals of a company, uh, interaction between revenues and costs, cash flows, and everything in between, and, is, and all of that thrown to the basket of macroeconomic variables, including the fact that uh, as an ordinary shareholder, there, uh, you are not guaranteed a dividend. Directors can, can be holding a very profitable and just decide not to pay a dividend. Um, now, those are two types of yields, or two types of incomes that generate two types of yield is fixed and variable or floating. Now the two types of risks, credit risk is quite simple. There's, there's no guarantee 
that you will actually get paid. Will the person who issued the instrument honor it? There are no risk-free assets in the world. There is always risk, even if it's not apparent. Um, even if you're doing a uh, the shortest dated US Treasury note, and no matter the fact that all academic papers point to the US, US T-bills as risk-free rate for the world, there is a probability, it is not zero, it is higher than zero that the US could default on, on the debt. And likewise with every other asset anywhere else on planet Earth. Um, now consider for a moment that if there is a credit risk and if your instrument has a default on it, what is the downside? The harshest downside in the worst and most uh, onerous and furthest back of the queue debt would probably be 100% full loss of capital. So consider this when reaching for an extra one or 2% yield, you might, might be risking 100% of your capital in this part of the market. Income investing is inherently conservative. Um, be very careful, make sure you are paid properly, properly um, and probabilistically for the extra risk and the extra uh, that you're taking. And then there is the, the rate, of, and I've touched on it, the risk that inflation rises or interest rates change, and ultimately that the real rates in the economy shift around. Credit risk may be a uh, apocalyptic risk if it happens, uh, one hopes it doesn't. Real rates risk inflation. If you're in a fixed in interest rate yielding instrument, inflation, inflation is your enemy. It's the one that quietly, you're in the, you're in the uh, proverbial pot uh, as the frog where the, where the heat is being turned up slowly and inflation is, is eating and destroying uh, your returns. Except inflation can also be your best friend because in some variable rate instruments, uh, your interest rate is in fact linked to it. Either which way, jumping away from the, uh, and if you've managed to get through those first couple of slides with us and you're still here, I promise you the presentation gets a lot more interesting from you because the theory is behind us and now we're going to touch on some visuals and some examples and it gets far more interesting. Now, if, if one considers, um, it's the safer asset. So if you if you were to stack up um, risks with compensation, and in this case you you want yield is how you're being compensated. So the income stream that you're getting into your bank account and how much you paid for it. If we put the safest asset on the far left of of a matrix and the riskiest in the far right, and likewise the lower, what we will find is that the yields typically stack up lowest to highest. So, for example, and intuitively, your cash in the bank account, um, if you, I'm not even talking fixed deposit, I'm literally talking your transactional bank account is um, probably your lowest yielding asset from a domestic perspective, uh, not, not, not getting exotic anywhere else. Um, but it's also the safest, arguably, and the most liquid. And likewise, you can get cash plus, which would be uh, effectively money, money market and, and some, some uh, clever instruments around. And then you start to shift up to sovereign bonds. And notice how sovereign bonds will pay you, you know, so cash in the bank account is probably yielding half to one to maybe 2% if you're in a riskier bank. Um, cash plus is maybe uh, yielding uh, one to two to two and a half percent. Our South African sovereign bonds are currently yielding 9%. Um, and that's an example of going up the risk curve. And then you start to hit this middle patch. And what you'll find is, and I put them in this order, but one could argue some should be below others and they should shift around. And in fact, when you start to granularly dig through high quality corporate bonds, preference shares, listed property, junk, junk bonds, mezzanine debt, and all these uh, kind of exotic yielding instruments, some some will yield higher and you, you start to get quite a dispersion uh, in terms of yield and risk in this part of the market. Um, so I stack them up this way. Easy arguments could be made that they could be stacked other ways. The point being is they will overlap uh, quite, quite a lot. Um, in fact, in certain instances, high quality property can yield lower than sovereign bonds and et cetera, et cetera, um, depending on where you are and depending on how it works. But just visually, it should make perfect sense that as one gets riskier, 
one gets paid to hold riskier. And then right at the top, I put yielding equity. Now, yielding equity can in fact have a much lower dividend yield than, for example, sovereign bond or, or corporate bond or even preference share. Um, but I put it much higher up in terms of the risk curve because I'm talking about yielding ordinary equity here. And there is no obligation for a company to declare a dividend, no matter how profitable they are. So every single one of these other, including listed property, if you're a real estate investment trust, REITs have obligations to pay. Every other, every single one of these uh, instruments has an obligation to pay a yield, except for yielding equity. That's why even though it might be a good quality business, if you're living on that income, it can be a risky income ask people that were living on Anglo-Americans uh, dividends that in the credit crisis, they cut it. Anglo-Americans still around with us. And in fact, it's doing well, but that was a tough year or two if you were living on Anglo-Americans income. Likewise, if you're living on, the, on uh, South African big banks dividend yields last year, well, as a sector, they cut them because the Reserve Bank asked them to. That was, and our banks are still here, but that was a tough year. Um, so this, in terms of risk, is not just reflecting the risk of the underlying, it's reflecting the risk of the income. Jumping, so we've, we've unpacked two types of yield. We understand two major types of risk in terms of analyzing this. We've stacked it up in terms of uh, risk reward on, on a very simple matrix. In terms of the JSE, what actually exists and we're not going offshore, we're not, we're, we're just looking at your domestic brokerage account. Uh, what, what can you possibly buy on the JSE to build a portfolio of income instruments? So the starting point is bonds. Um, and domestically, these, the major of them would be South African government bonds. They are corporate bonds and they are some corporate paper and the like. We're getting uh, less liquid and more exotic there just highlighting there, there, but for this purposes, let's talk about fixed income bonds. And in South Africa, it's predominantly South African. As a retail investor, I would not advise going into this market. Are you buying the R186? Where on the yield curve are you buying? Which bond? These, this would, could be an entire another presentation, just, uh, just unpacking how to invest in this part of the market. But on the JSE, there are ETFs that are bonds. In uh, our domestic uh, fund management and asset management market, there are fund managers that uh, have bond funds. So it's good to know the asset class exists and there are routes into it. That's not one that as a retail investor, I'd, I'd go granularly in, I'd make an allocation and either do it passively or actively. Inflation linked bonds are similar to fixed income bonds, but they, they are linked to inflation. So that's one of the variables, um, which, which does nullify one of the risks facing you, but understands that ILBs, inflation-linked bonds in South Africa, have actually underperformed for years because our inflation has been falling. You're actually making a spot call there. So you are hedging yourself, but understand what you're doing. Similar to fixed income bonds, I would not walk granularly into this market stock picking or bond picking as it, as it were. Um, go via a fund or ETF active or passive, um, choose your allocation and blend it. Uh, then we're jumping, we're going a little riskier. There's listed property. Uh, REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trusts. The, in fact, the legislation is that 70, at least 75% of a, a South African REIT, REIT's distributable income must be de declared to investors. Um, which means that to some degree, if you pick a good quality REIT, it's, it's got very profitable rentals, long-term, good escalations, et cetera, et cetera, ticks all the boxes. There is a degree of stability of this income, but there is quite a long list of REITs on the JSE, and many of them have underperformed and done really badly in the last uh, couple of years, mostly because they're retail orientated. They have shopping centers, and I don't think, it's what I, I, I don't think what South Africa needs is another shopping center. And uh, combine that with uh, pandemic and lockdown, and all of this has become a very difficult underperforming portion of, of the market. But there are enough REITs 
that one can granularly dig through and find parts of the market that are doing well. Uh, for example, at this point, if you have convenience in rural malls, they're doing quite well. If you have a portfolio that has storage or logistics, residential, you can be doing quite well as well there. So this is a good part of the market to handpick selected property exposures that you want to. Understand it is a bit riskier. Look for a clear strategy in good asset class. Look for low gearing, strong cash flows, good tenant mixes, retentions, weighted the whale uh, item I'm, I'm talking about there stands for weighted average lease uh, expiry. If you want longest possible leases, you want good escalations, low vacancies. And, and so dig through this part of the market. There are good things. I think this part of the market would lend itself very well at this point in the cycle to granularly uh, picking the ones that we want. Then we shift to preference shares. Preference shares are shrinking markets. Um, Although they, there's still enough of them and there's still um, many liquid ones and attractive ones such that at a retail or small boutique fund management level, we can make a lot of use of this. Um, now, what is a preference share? It differs from an ordinary share because it's, it gets a preferential slice of the profits. And in many instances, that is a guaranteed slice, but it doesn't necessarily get anything beyond that. Now, preference shares are quite exotic shares, uh, and you cannot assume one preference share is the same as another one. Those terms of reference, or those, uh, those founding documents, memorandums, can be written differently. So don't make any assumptions until you have read it or asked investor relations or researched it, um, because you can get cumulative, non-cumulative, redeemable, non-redeemable. There can be unique clauses, um, it could be all sorts of things, but after telling you not to take anything as a generalization in the preference share market, I'm going to make a broad generalization. In South Africa, on the JSE, the majority of our listed preference shares have floating yields that track prime rates. Um, that means that most of them are, are floating rate yielding instruments, but what they declare are dividends, not interest. So um, consider when picking through, granularly picking through this market, consider the liquidity of the individual share, not just its yield, but also consider the creditworthiness and the profitability of the issuer. You might have preferential share of profits, but if the company is never profitable, that's not gonna go very far, no matter how cumulative your dividend is. Um, and then consider in some instances, preference shares do not attach to the hold codes, so the listed group. Give you an example. Uh, PSG is currently buying back their preference shares. Their preference shares do not attach to the listed PSG. Their preference shares attach to the subsidiary to the listed company that holds their financial services side. Um, that means it's got a different credit risk to the, to the bigger, larger listed company. Um, I touched on that all of our preference shares, uh, well, most of our preference shares pay yield. I'll give you an example. If you have a look at Northam's Zambezi Pref structure, that was a compounding uh, variable rate yield, but it did not, in fact, pay dividends. So I cannot emphasize enough in this market. Go granularly into it and pick it. There are great opportunities, but don't make assumptions here. Do, do your homework. So I shift from preference shares to ordinary shares. And ordinary shares, there's still a place within an income generating portfolio, depending on your risk appetite, depending on um, the opportunity set available to you to add in high quality yielding ordinary shares. Now, these are very risky instruments if you're living off the income, because not just can they be volatile in terms of capital value, their income can be volatile based on both profits and, in fact, uh, directed decisions to pay or not pay dividends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but analyze them like you would analyze investments, Consider the, but also consider how those fundamentals impact on dividends, dividend policies, and related variables. But don't just ignore this portion for, for a income generating portfolio because you can get capital growth from here and there is an inherent inflation hedge if one, and possibly currency hedge if one selects correctly. I'll go back and I 
I emphasize the example, if you're living off Anglo-Americans' dividends in the credit crisis, that was a bleak year or two or three. Yeah. Likewise, if you're living off our local banks' dividend, ordinary dividends, because in fact, our local banks did honor their preference dividends uh, last year, but they did not pay. Uh, they, and as far as our, off, off the top of my head, I don't think a single one of our local banks paid after the Reserve Bank asked them not to, paid an ordinary dividend. But every single one of them honored their preference dividends. Point being, high quality yielding equity has a place within uh, 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 a balanced income portfolio, but it is a risky place and position size and manage risk and do your research and be cognizant of that. Um, then you get other instruments. Don't forget, cash is a position. Cash in your bank or cash in your investment account. That is a position and it yields. Well, in South Africa, at least it does. Sorry for the guys in Europe. Then you get retail saving bonds. Uh, those are online. You get global bond ETFs, global property ETFs. There's global equity ETFs, but I wouldn't, wouldn't consider them necessarily yielding instruments, um, although they do, in some instances, pay uh, dividend yields. So um, we've chatted through the types of uh, returns, uh, zoomed into two types of yield. We under uh, we understand the risks involved and now we've unpacked, unpacked a range of investment avenues and asset classes and different instrument types that are yielding that one can build an income generating portfolio for yourself um, across the JSE and just looking at the JSE. So let's keep this practical and let's keep this executable so that we can do this. Um, now let's dive into a couple of examples. And I'm going to start with the South African government bond. The standard South African government bond is a fixed rate bond. Uh, now, this chart on the right, if we take the yield of that bond, the top line, and we subtract the CPR, inflation, which is the line that bounces around a lot, we effectively get the real yield of that bond. Now, interestingly enough, in the credit crisis, that briefly went negative, but ignoring that and looking at about a 15-year uh, average real yield, our South, African, our South African bonds, 10-year government bond, on average has a real yield of 4.3%. That means whatever inflation is, you're getting 4.3% 4, 4 more than that, just holding this bond. Now, is that a lot or is that little? Well, Currently, we can see that the real yield is trading higher than the long-term average. So that's, that's a great sign. If mean reversion dictates everything, but we know that mean reversion does not. If, if statistics was all there was to a stock market, the richest people in the world would be statisticians, and they're not. So moving on. Everything is relative. So let's glance at the real yields across the BRICS. And now in any yielding uh, comparison, I always, use, I always include the USA as the world's inverted commas risk-free rate. And the, uh, and the US 10 years currently yielding 1%. In fact, inflation is ticking up uh, there. This is uh, starting to approach zero. But ignoring that, that providing context, if we compare South Africa's real yield, which is here's the, here's the actual bond yield, chopping off the inflation, and we get a 6% real yield. That 6% real yield compares quite attractively um, and stacks up as the second highest real yield against the BRICS. And in fact, our credit risk is not materially higher than India or Russia, yet we've got a way higher um, real yield. We, we are in line with Brazil, but particularly as a South African investor, I'm not sure I take Brazilian currency risk. So from a domestic income perspective, our bonds are attractive. They, they stack up well against themselves. They stack up well against our peer group and relative to our credit, credit risk and the like. Now that's just a 10 year bond. How does retail go about this? Well, there's good routes into these bonds. First of all, you, like I said, you can allocate to a fund manager and you can outsource this job. If you want to do it yourself, there are, um, you can go and handpick the bond to buy, or you can merely allocate to a passive. There's new funds, Govi ETF, and there's the Satrix SA bond ETF. These ETFs do not buy the 10 year bond, they buy a spread across the yield curve. So they do have slightly different average maturities, but they roll them. Um, and that, once again, it's, an, um, it's effectively outsourcing uh, this, this approach, and it's a very uh, easy, easy allocation to this place. But this is, this is an example 
of a uh, yielding instrument available uh, through multiple routes on the JSC and domestically, and one that looks relatively attractive despite its risks. Shifting from a fixed coupon domestic bond to a floating rate domestic preference share that attaches to Investec. Now, Investec's credit, credit rating is pretty good. Uh, no problems there. And in fact, I would argue in terms of this credit rating, it's all nice and pretty, but um, there is a backstop that if one of the major banks in South Africa were to get into trouble, our reserve bank would probably step in to bail them out. So Investec may be one of the riskier and racier large banks in South Africa, but do you think the Reserve Bank would let them fail? It would step in in an instance where Standard Bank or Absol first strand was failing and not bail out Investec. I think the systemic risk is too high, and hence I think that in this instance, if you're purely selecting, and this, uh, this graph to the side, uh, to the side shows the clean yields in for the preference shares on a 12-month rolling basis, assuming that interest rates don't change, um, and it's only the banking shares, I would argue that all these banks, from a preference shareholder perspective and from, a, from an ultimate, uh, from a credit risk perspective, probably have more or less the same credit risk, irrespective of the credit ratings, just because of the backstop to the Reserve Bank. Hence, once we've ticked that box that you're a major bank and there's a backstop, um, let's select the highest yield um, because we're comfortable with that risk. And in terms of, of this chart, it's quite simple. Vestex INPR dividend uh, or preference share has the highest yield. This INPPR one it is an Investec preference share, but it has no liquidity in the market. So it's not very actionable. So the INPR preference share, has the best yield, ticks the box in terms of domestic banking uh, uh, counterparty risk. It pays a percentage of prime that's floating, liquid in the market, ticks all those boxes. The one black mark against it is it's non-cumulative, which now some of these other preference shares are non-cumulative. Perhaps this is why the Investec one is a slightly higher yield, but it's probably also because it attaches to Investec and the market views Investec is slightly riskier. I think uh, that actually provides the opportunity as opposed to profit. Then shifting from a fixed coupon bond and a, pref a floating rate preference share to a high quality div a dividend yielding ordinary share. British American Tobacco is one of the largest global tobacco groups in the world. I don't think I need to explain to anyone uh, what they do, what they sell or where they operate. There are pros to this business. Uh, the pro is that it's got a long stable history uh, of dividends. This chart at the top is a 20-year dividend history. Despite everything, British American tobacco in 20 years has not missed a single dividend. And these dividends have grown over 20 years by 9.5%. Both this fixed coupon bond and this preference share don't grow their dividends. They, their dividend uh, is either a fixed income set from a, a guaranteed fixed income from, from a bond or it tracks an interest rate and interest rates don't compound. They just are what they are. This, on the other hand, has actually grown at 9.5%. Not just grown to 9.5%, it's grown 9.5% in pounds. So incredible uh, dividend track record. Um, and they, they can do this because their business is inherently cash generative with a deeply inelastic product. What I mean by inelastic products with our pricing power is last year, and I'm sure all of us have friends, if not ourselves, that smoke, and we all got to see the prices that cigarettes got, and not even nice cigarettes, quite horrible cigarettes by the sounds of it, got on the black market. That shows you the pricing power of this product, um, and that creates the underpin for the, for the for the profits, for the cash generation, and ultimately for the dividends. Um, the cons are that, well, cigarettes kill you. Uh, this is arguably a sunset industry with deep regulatory risk, um, declining volumes, shrinking numbers of smokers. Um, and if these businesses can't reinvent themselves through uh, 
alternatives and there are ranges of alternatives they're all exploring and they are growing um there is there is a deep downside sunset clause here um there's also esg risks maybe morally and ethically you don't want to hold something like this and that's fine we respect that as well um in the background in the balance sheet uh british american tobacco is also highly geared off the american acquisition and don't forget Although they're declaring these dividends in pounds, their income stream, which is the ultimate forex risk, is in fact global. And it's all sorts of currencies from all around the world that are then arrive and get translated into pounds, dividend gets declared in pounds, then ultimately you as a South African shareholder will receive that in rands. There is a lot of currency volatility here and as much complexity as one, one can uh, see. Um, and that is a risk because that uh, if you're investing for income, you want um, you want clarity in terms of that, no risk. Uh, so that remains a risk. But British American Tobacco is currently trading at about a let's call it an eight percent yield, and has a consensus forward yield of a little higher than eight percent because once again, they are arguably growing their profits. They are not static. Um, anyhow, these are examples, and let's let's have a summary and let's jump into questions so once again there's two types of investments capital growth or yield and that all depends on when the cash flows after buying the investment the paying for it when do the cash flows come back into your bank account there is a place for yield particularly as a person ages and their time horizon shifts they should be building yield um, building income in the background such that ultimately they can live on their capital and uh, not uh, not have to work so the discussion of yield and income is perennially, uh, is permanently, it is eternal. It is always worth looking at. And in fact, even when one is young, this can offer good opportunities uh, across a portfolio. So never forget that. There are two types of major types of yield, fixed and floating. I think I've unpacked those. Yield is two major, uh, major risks, uh, real rates and credit risk or counterparty risk. Now there's plenty of domestically listed options to choose from. I've unpacked them. I've showed, showed them on a uh, risk reward curve. Um, hopefully we're at the point, all of this is making sense and we can open for questions. Uh, thanks Keith, a couple of questions coming through. Folks, you got questions, uh, drop them in the Q&A box. I actually see some coming on Twitter and that works too, I suppose. Uh, Aldrich, you're asking about interest on crypto, riskiest? Absolutely. And not just because the volatility of, of crypto, um, but understand how they generate that yield on the crypto is that essentially they are lending your coins to a third party who then sort of uses, the clients can then use them for shorting. In other words, there is default risk. Keith mentioned right up front that 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 counterparty risk, uh, and and I mean you have very very serious counterparty risk uh, in the crypto space. Uh, Keith, you're not the expert here, but maybe you've got the, the questions coming through. What about yield if you're sitting in U.S. dollar? Uh, my sense is not much at all. I mean, with interest rates in the U.S. practically zero, you're, you're not going to get much traditional yield anywhere. So, so this is actually a more complicated question. I want to stand back because there's two answers depending on where you're sitting. Now, an income oriented portfolio, you're building this and you're operating this and running this for a person who's living on it um, because they're typically drawing from it. Now, where their expenses lie dictates a lot of things. If you live in South Africa, you should have a, a a good weighting of South African yielding assets for because you're matching income and expenditure. Um, now you can hold US yielding assets and you might do well, you might do badly, you might be correct in terms of um, in terms of buying uh, buying XYZ yielding asset in, in the States, but then the RAND moves against you. And then you've got to uh, bring the money back on shore because you're living on it and creates a whole lot of complexities. So in income and these sort of portfolios need to be bespokely built for clients and, and you, one needs to understand where they're living, where their expenses are. But if you're living in the States, by all means, build a US yielding um, uh, portfolio, in which case take all these things I said and copy and paste them on that market and their market is much larger and it's far more options. So sure, the US may not, uh, the US 
10-year uh, treasury may, may be yielding effectively zero in terms of real rates, but the longer dated US aren't. The longer dated US have potentially higher real yields. So if you're willing to take a uh, maturity risk and push yourself out on the yield curve, and, and the further out on the yield curve you go, the more dangerous and more exposed to inflation you become. Uh, but if you're willing to take the risk, you can pick up uh, bond, bond yields that are or potentially attractive. Then don't forget that they have a listed uh, property space. So there's Salmon Group, uh, biggest listed REITs on planet Earth that sits in America. You can, so you can go and build income in US dollars and around uh, US listed REITs. There is also AT&T as listed telcos. You know, we've got Vodacom in South Africa that yields quite attractively. It was a, it was, it was a toss up between uh, British American Tobacco or Vodacom where they used this as an example. Honestly, I think uh, British American Tobacco is more attractive. <laughs> so that's why I use that as this case study. But Vodacom does exist. Likewise, in the States, there's AT&T as a high, a high quality yielding telco. Um, then you've got listed utilities. So you can do this in the States and you can do this in dollars and you can do this in pounds. But your starting point is to say, what is, if I'm building a yielding portfolio to live on it, where are my expenses? Let's build sufficient yield in, in the currency and in the assets with the liquidity to match those expenses. Once I've got that covered, I can start to play with an allocation beyond that. But, um, and you can start to take currency risk and start to go global and things like that. But always be cognizant that you're starting to take currency risk then, and you're starting to take liquidity risk and all these things. So that's a very long answer because that's, that might be a short question to ask, but it's very contextual, which is the right answer. <laughs> Um, no, fair shot. Serena, so, you're asking if the Absa Gavi bond ETF is a total return ETF. Um, and my gut response was it was, but then they switched to paying out. But now I'm checking the sense announcement and they are referring to actually uh, uh, not paying out. In other words, it is total return. Keith, do you know what happened there? I know they were going to switch it to total return. Uh, perhaps they ch this is the NF Gavi, I'm assuming. Yes. Uh that, that's a good question. Uh, I need to double check that. I think they're sitting as total return. I yeah, used that as are. an example in allocation. And that's that's good to highlight that. You won't technically get a yield. Mm -hmm. So your capital will grow at that yield or on compound. But as far as I'm aware right now, that is a total return uh, bond ETF. For the rest of you that don't know what that means, it means the ETF doesn't pay out the interest earned. It merely reinvests it back into the bonds, uh, which allows you to compound. So they issued a sense on the 20th of October saying that they were going to change away from total return. Um, and it seems not to have happened. I don't know, and I'm not seeing any sense as to saying why it didn't go ahead. Uh, maybe it's a process, oh, withdrawal of the announcement. Okay, there we go. And 10 days later, they changed their mind. Serena, you are correct. That is a total return ETF. So you, you earn the interest, as Keith says, but it gets added to the base cost rather than paying out uh, into your account. Mark, you're asking about uh, to, to diversify yield based on an equity portfolio, uh, a range of equities that have produced high yields. I mean, Keith, this is, you can build. I mean, there's always the risks. You mentioned Anglo, but, you know, some British American tobacco, uh, some Vodacom. Uh, there are a couple of others that have got a, a decent yield on our market. You could build a sort of equity portfolio uh, that, that has a, a relatively high yield. Absolutely. Um, and in fact, in some instances, that's quite attractive. But then it's down to stock picking. And you can be right in terms of the company, and, but they pull their dividend because they do a big acquisition or because a pandemic hits and there's a lockdown and they just want to conserve cash. So. You've got to be careful. One can build an attractive yielding equity portfolio, but those are riskier to live on. Uh, if you're living on this money flowing back into your bank account, um, that's a very risky way to do it, including some, absolutely. Uh, diversification, the capital growth side, and you, the, all, all of that. Like, uh, it makes, makes a lot of sense, but making it 100% that, well, that's just an equity portfolio then. Yeah. Um, high yielding one, but not an income. And, and also some of them understand, I mean, for example, Billiton's showing a yield of 5%, but that included a, a special dividend, 
So that is is not always going to be the case. You know, it, 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 maybe we get another one. Uh, Kumba iron ore, a nine percent yield, but uh, deeply cyclical. Kumba has been on the verge of bankruptcy at points in the last well, ten years as well. Yeah, let, let, let me just go on record as saying my personal opinion: never include a cyclical asset, no matter what the yield is, into an income generating portfolio, like mining resources. Um, all of those things because their bottom line, they're exposed to too many volatile spots. So at the moment when like the mining sector is paying, generating huge free cash flows and paying fantastic dividends, but who knows in five years time, it could be almost hitting the wall. Um, yeah. These types of companies are too volatile and their bottom lines are too volatile. Um, high yielding and using ordinary shares to supplement uh, an income yielding portfolio and add in some diversification across asset class and protection against inflation, capital upside and the like, make, are typically defensive uh, businesses, typically um, hugely inelastic products, you know, British American tobacco, telcos, these are, these are great examples. Anglo-American, Kumba, ooh, no, that's, <laughs> yeah. Who knows what next year's dividend will be? Yeah. Uh, Adam's asking two questions. Keith is he's asking best yielding corporate preference besides the Investec one, um, and he also says companies moving away from preference shares, and that's some sort of how the the debt is viewed. I mean, certainly in the early sort of two or to right up until about two thousand and eight, uh, they were huge, and then they really have sort of lost their day in the sun. Yeah. So. Uh, offhand, highest yielding non-banking preference shares. I mean, you, you're looking at a basket there of Grinwood and Victor. Um, and, and as you go higher up that yield curve, you go higher up, uh, higher up the risk, you know. Um, but in terms of why companies aren't using these instruments more, it's, it, it's, it's actually simpler to answer from a banking perspective. And uh, the banks have capital adequacy requirements. Basel three requirements that dictate into buckets of liquidity um, that they put these assets. And preference shares have been badly ruled against and viewed as, as um, you know, not very liquid. And, and hence, they're getting, they're getting double penalized for holding them. Then from a company perspective and from a more traditional business perspective, although you, because you're getting paid a dividend, it's attractive as a as a personal, you know, from a private, uh, from a private individual's perspective on how tax treats dividends. But also, a company then can't deduct that; it's not tax deductible. Yeah, uh, a preference share dividend is not tax deductible. So they, so like there are periods and times, depending on interest rates and tax legislation, that make preference shares favorable for companies to issue them. That's probably the time to not buy them. <laughs> when companies are buying all these instruments back, it's probably a very good indication that now's a great time to hold them. Yeah. So, like, um, Capitex being buying around back out. as well, I think Sasfin. Serena, you point out the Vanguard, the Vanguard high dividend yield ETF, biggest holding in SA, British American Tobacco. Well spotted on that. Um, Keith, uh, so Brian's asking about the, the Pref Share ETF, Pref uh, T F T X is the code, how to know, determine forward yield. I mean, in essence, you'd have to look at the holdings and then crunch it out and, and, and determine it. I don't think core shares give a forward yield on it. Yeah, so I actually like some of the core shares uh, products. Pref products is not one of them. Their tier ratio eats their yield alive. If you take their constituents and you work out, if you hold those in your own name in the weightings, what your yield would be, and then you work out what yield you're getting on Pref tracks, there is a significant deterioration in the yield because of the costs in the spread. Um, that I think this market works better to go direct than buy a passive. But yeah. that's just my matter of opinion. And pref tracks absolutely is there, and pref tracks can absolutely be yield used. Um, it's forward yield. Yeah, uh, Simon is right. One has to just sit and crunch the numbers. There. Yeah. So that 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 tour is 0.56%. Some of its own might not seem like a heck of a lot, but of course it's an annual term. Um, whereas if you know your, your brokerage might be around half a percent, but that's a, a one-off fee on, on the point of buying. Uh, Tian, you're asking about in your tax-free 
uh, to save on the dividend withholding tax. Absolutely, uh, they're certainly in the same with the, uh, the, the the government bonds ETFs, which can also go in. Sean, you're asking about no SA small cap ETF yet. Uh, is it achievable? Uh, Keith, my sense is it's probably just not achievable because of liquidity. So the short answer is no. I, I don't think... Um, so e even in the States, they struggle with small cap ETFs, although there are some. Um, and in fact, you find that they, they have little clauses in them where they talk about equivalence beta. What that means is that they don't hold all the stocks in the universe. They yeah. construct using quants, sufficient stocks that they arrive at a one beta relative to that benchmark. And then they perhaps write some ETNs and notes into that and, and funny things to, to create a, a uh, synthetic uh, return that is, that is similar. Uh, South Africa is just not big enough, not liquid enough, uh, that part of the market. Unless something dramatically changes for the positive, I don't think that part of the market will ever see a valid or viable ETF. Yeah, and then to get technical, it would be synthetic, so then it would be an ETN, not an ETF, because I agree, they wouldn't be able to do it without doing it synthetic. Uh, Lawrence is asking, uh, in midlife stage, 15 to 20 year horizon, would it be strategy to go all out equity and switching to income nearer to retirement? Lawrence, I wouldn't say all out equity. My sense is that you want, so, so when you're starting to live off your investments, and whenever that is, I mean, maybe you're 40, maybe you're 80, whatever the age is, in essence, you probably, to reduce risk, want the next couple of years of income in cash, maybe three, maybe five, depending how you want to, to manage your, your risk profile. And there's bunches of ways you can feed that cash power. You can feed it from income, as we've chatted today. You can feed it from sales, annuities, et cetera, et cetera. But I think your point is, is that, you know, I buy some high yielding assets because I like that cash flow, which I then deploy back into the market. Um, many folks with a long time horizon say, I don't need the cash. So, you know, give me the growth, which as Keith pointed out up front is the, the sort of the, the, the other way we get return, either by the yield slash income or the growth coming through. Eldrich, uh, which div, pref div, prop ETF would you recommend? Um, so our dividend ETFs on the JSC are, are actually using dividends as a filtering metric rather than offering a high dividend yield. Um, and there's the, only the one pref uh, ETF available, which Keith mentioned already. Uh, Keith, the property ETFs, I mean, the property ETFs, the problem with that is you've got a basket and in that concentration basket, risk yeah man you've got some horror stocks yeah um so neither one of those would i go passive route i would go granular stock picking active route um just because just because of either the concentrations in the market mm -hmm. um or the various various characteristics of what is in those in indices it just doesn't make sense to just do a, a blind allocation there. One has to do it very op open eyes, and that means stock picking. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I hear you on that. No, agreed on that. Uh, folks, not seeing more questions coming through, and we're about to bump up on time. Uh, so let's park it there for now. A uh, quick bit of housekeeping. The event that we had with Sam Beck-Bessinger that uh, collapsed and didn't happen, that is rescheduled for 27 May three weeks today, we're going to get Sam four different backups of internet, uh, and that invite will be up on the on the website, justonelap.com, uh, certainly by midday tomorrow. Uh, Keith, really appreciate your time. Uh, ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening, uh, and everyone, stay safe.